I'm Sean Griffin. Welcome to Morning Cup of Context. Thanks for joining me. This morning I was reading in 1 John chapter 3, and a statement popped out at me that um, when I first became a believer, it really, I struggled with it because um, it, it convicted me all the time, right? And because I, I, it made me think that, man, am I not saved? What's going on? So it was, um, it's something I struggled with for a long time, but as for over the last 20 years I've been researching scripture, you know, uh, literally daily, that I find, you know, a lot of these things are cleared up when we get a better understanding of the foundations of Scripture that are layered throughout the book. That's why I actually made the context tree, and that's why we actually have these these branches on the tree as I do, because um, each of these themes on the branch, you know, understanding the context of those themes in Scripture help us greatly understand the book, and it makes it very easy to read, to understand, and to enjoy as a message from our Creator to us through the, His loving Messiah, right? So what I wanted to show here in 1 John chapter 3 is that um, this say, is verse 9, it says, No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So when I was younger and I read this and it said, you know, <laughs> the seed abides in me, cannot sin, I thought to myself, well, man, I, I sin every day. I mess up every day. I, you know, but what about 1 John 1, 9, two chapters earlier, where it says, if you confess your sins, he's just and righteous to forgive you of all unrighteousness, right? Because he's our high priest. And I just thought to myself, well, wait a minute. How do I reconcile these two concepts here? What's going on? And that's where, you know, it took me quite some time and many years and lots of guilt to finally come to this place where I understood the first resurrection, all right? So the first resurrection is an idea that actually, you know, it's all throughout Scripture. It's a part of the covenant. If you haven't seen the two videos I've already put out on it, it's one of the context branches on the tree. So please take a moment um, after this video, go and check out those other videos where I break down the, the idea of the first resurrection from start to finish, from Genesis to Revelation, its implications, how it's described, what's going to happen at that time, when it happens, um, everything from Scripture so that we can have a better understanding of the paradigm of this all throughout scripture there's a lots of statements made referring to the first resurrection from the prophets in the scriptures and in first john here um this one's talking about he who is born of god uh, no one who is born of god practices sin because his seed meaning god's seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god right but again how do you reconcile that? Because I sinned and I acknowledged it and I had to confess and that's what it tells me to confess, right? That's why Jesus is our high priest to whom I can confess, right? So I had to really try to figure out, wait a minute, am I not saved? I'm, I'm, I'm sinning, am I, am I not saved? What, what's happening here? So then I, I had to research the idea of cannot sin, all right? And that is a phrase that goes back to Enoch chapter five, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And, and again, as in the first resurrection videos, that I, I put up there on the screen. I'm gonna put I'm gonna link in the comments on this video. Uh, you can go check those out and I explain that term about our resurrected bodies and when we step into this idea of having our hearts circumcised by the Father at the New Covenant where we cannot sin because we've been born of God, all right? And it's an amazing thing. But why? But why would John use this particular passage here and just not explain it? Well, again, he's speaking from the context of understanding the first resurrection. But even within that context, this is a statement that's called prolepsis. Prolepsis is a figure of speech in which a future act or development is represented as if it's already accomplished or existing. And a buddy showed me this a couple years ago, uh, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And in addition to my first resurrection studies, man, it just it, it made so many passages by Paul um, and, and John and, and other places in the epistle writings that just cleared it right up. It just it instantly, you knew, oh, they're referring to a future event with the confidence that it's already happened because that's how much confidence they had in the promise of God through his Messiah, that, the, that it was a finished work, it's just gonna now, the details are just gonna work themselves out, right? Because he's overcome, he's victorious, and so therefore it's just now, it's just according to the appointed times the Father has determined for these things to play out, but there's no chance that God's gonna fail in his promises. They're already gonna happen, and they're, they're speaking of them as if they're already reality because that's the kind of faith they're speaking with, right? They understand God will not fail. So that's what prolepsis is as a figure of speech. There's a couple different definitions of prolepsis. Uh, they're all along the same vein. And the, the definition I just gave you is, is usually the second definition you'll find in like a Britannica or you know Webster's or something like that. So 
in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, Paul also uses prolepsis. It's pretty interesting. He says, But God, being rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do Am I sitting in heavenly places? And no. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm sitting in uh, in my home in Colorado, right? So this is very interesting to me that I, I how do I take this seriously, right? And this is where people say, oh, it's just a metaphor, right? You're in the authority of Christ. You're raised up. And this is where people have taken these and stretched them out into all kinds of unique, interesting teachings. You know what I mean? But I would contend that this is a proleptic statement because we are not raised up and seated with him in heavenly places until the first resurrection. And that's why Yeshua actually mentions and references in Romans chapter 2 and 3 that he who overcomes, I will give him the right to sit on my throne with me just as I earn the right to sit on my father's throne with him. Right, so this is a this is an illusion. This is a reference and a prolectic statement going up to what's going to happen, what's promised to happen. All right, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. We see it again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. All right, so we believe in faith that we've been saved, and that He's going to save us on the day of the Lord. He's going to resurrect our bodies from Sheol. We're going to be saved from the second death. Right, this is the scriptural definition of salvation. And on the day of the Lord, we're resurrected. We take part in that first resurrection, brought out of Sheol, given brand new spiritual bodies that will, you know, will not be able to sin, that cannot sin. We're raised up with them to be hidden away into the new Jerusalem while the day of the Lord happens. We're saved from the wrath of the Lamb that happens on the wicked on the earth in that time. So that is, you know, the, the fundamental fundamental uh, transitioning there of the first resurrection, which encompasses the definition, the scriptural definition of the word being saved. All right. He's speaking about it proleptically. In 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23, it says, Since you have been in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. All right. So, <laughs> I've been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. Uh, okay. Well, if I've been born again, I... You know, again, if I take this literally, if I've actually been born again, I'm actually doing an entire separate video of context, a morning cup of context on the term being born again as Jesus defines it and Isaiah defines it. And so, um, but I, I think that in his, in Peter's use of this here, he's speaking proleptically, like we will be born again at the resurrection with imperishable seed, right? The seed of God. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 explains to us about the resurrection. All right, and when did this happen here? In 1 John, 2, uh, 1 John 2, verses 20 through 29, he says, Now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Right? And so these are proleptic statements because we know that we're practicing righteousness, we're walking in righteousness, we'll be born of him in the future with the heart that's circumcised by the Father upon our resurrected bodies into immortal, incorruptible bodies that cannot sin. So it's just another first resurrection mention about uh, being born of him at that time. So this is why I just want to hopefully bring some clarity to this idea because I, I see a lot of, there's, a, there's so many more statements in the New Testament that, that can, prolepsis, uh, can help understand these statements and why they're made because it seems like the reality of those statements as we look around us in our modern life and as we walk out our faith with God doesn't seem to be a reality, right? So we look around and go, how does that statement work? I, I'm not seated with him in heavenly realms. I, I'm, I'm not at a place where I cannot sin. Does that mean I'm not saved? No, no. It just means simply that the first resurrection hasn't happened yet. That's the context that they're speaking of, but they're speaking confidently of when that time comes that God will not fail in his promises and will save us and will bring us into a time where these words will be fulfilled. So this is an actual literary term called prolepsis and the epistle writers used it a lot, just like they use metaphors and illusions and um, you know other literary concepts. All right guys, uh, so I hope this helps and um, if you were like me and for many years you struggle with you know, self-condemnation because of a verse like that you didn't understand and no one's ever explained it to you, um, I hope that helps, okay, to free you up to understand that um, we can expect the Father to take us to a place where we cannot sin when we're born of Him. But for now, we're in a place where we do make mistakes and we do mess up. 
thankfully, as First John 1 9 says, in many other places, in Hebrews and other places, that we have a faithful high priest who will not fail us in Yeshua of Nazareth, our Messiah, right, the Son of God, and he is going to actually be able to make atonement for us. He receives our confession like the high priest did in Leviticus uh, back in the, you know, in the Old Testament, right? So that is how he performs the office of that, so that he actually makes atonement for us upon our confession. And um, so to provide forgiveness of sin, and, you know, we can get our conscience uh, clean and we can work on sanctification which means we get his word in us more and more and then that behavior starts to fade away as we get better at practicing righteousness and we grow in our sanctification and knowledge of God. Okay guys, I want to encourage you with that. If, you, if this video helps you, like, share, and subscribe. Help us get the word out uh, because there are a lot of people that have these questions and, and no one's answering them. So I'm going to try to do my best to, to address as many as I can. And um, uh, if you're seeing us on Facebook, or excuse me, on YouTube, um, make sure you like and then you have to when you subscribe that you have to tap the bell that way they notify you when I put out new videos All right, so I really appreciate you guys um, And I hope uh, to see you back here tomorrow morning All right.